discuss the theme of appearance versus reality in Macbeth. Right, so first of all, when you state a theme, it's not a great idea to state it as a phrase. I know that somewhere um, we're going to get to My Children, My Africa, which talks about order versus disorder. But this kind of Twitter answer is just too short. So the first thing, Margaret, is put it as a sentence, is that appearances may hide reality. So once you've got it like that, you can see, ah, yes. So if we're asked, what did you say there? Just discuss the theme. Okay. So think of the characters. Macbeth. What does he... Well, what is he at the beginning? I don't want to say, does he appear to be. At the beginning of the play, he is a hero. He has saved Scotland from two attacks. One is an internal civil war. One is an external threat from Norway. So he is the hero. But as the play progresses, we see that he maintains an appearance of loyalty to Duncan while he is, in fact, planning his murder. And then, as the play proceeds, he tries to maintain that appearance of honesty, of somebody who wants the truth about Duncan's murder to be known, but in fact, he's hiding that truth. However, in a character like Banquo, Banquo is honest and truthful. So when, ask yourself why Shakespeare has Macbeth and Banquo meet the witches. Because he could easily have had Macbeth meet the witches by himself. But he wants an honest, decent, upright man's response to the witches, as opposed to Macbeth's response, which is already devious and self-seeking. So Banquo's appearance is honest. And if you remember, uh, Macbeth says to Banquo, if you will be loyal to me when I am king, the way it was predicted by the witches, I will reward you. And what does Banquo say to him? He says to him, as long as my loyalty to you in no way compromises my previously sworn loyalty to Duncan. And Macbeth's answer is good night. He stops the conversation right there because he knows that Banquo will not support him if he suspects that he is guilty in any way of Duncan's murder. So you need to weigh it up. What is the appearance? What is the reality? Lady Macbeth appears to be ruthless, but she's not. She tries to make herself into that ruthless person who can conspire in the murder of the king. But she actually isn't that person. She is the person who can't get the blood off her hands. All right, so you need to look at that. So that's what they want you to do. And this is true of whatever play you're studying. If it is... Othello, I've said already, the appearance of Iago is honest Iago. Everybody calls Iago honest in that play. Everybody. He has this appearance, but it's not the reality. If you are doing the crucible, the appearance there 
For example, John Proctor appears to be an upright member of the community, but he's committed adultery. Uh, Danforths, Hawthorne appear to be solid judges, but they are corrupt. So you need the girls appear to be pure and innocent. Look what they're up to. So look at the play, Hamlet. Think about the quotes that you get. It is Duncan who says, there is no art to find the mind's construction in the face. It is Claudius who talks about how smart a lash that speech doth give my conscience. He talks about how we sugar o'er the devil himself. And so does, that's Polonius. But the idea of sugaring over the devil, a sugary outside, the devil inside. You know, those kinds of things. Look for the language. Look at the imagery. Okay, so Margaret, I hope that's helped you. Then Jessica, you were the one who asked about the suitability and effectiveness of a figure of speech in poetry. I hope we've discussed that. If I can, I'm going to come back to the student who wanted um, everything has changed except graves. I haven't looked at that. Lutolwetu, you want the themes of my children, my Africa. You know, I think they're probably listed in the book. Um, I didn't check, but it'll be in whatever study guide. Sorry, I've got a million books here. Whoa! That was Dorian Gray that's just fallen. But if you have a look in your text, I'm sure there will be notes on the themes. Yup. So you've got character and theme. So you should have this text. If you have a look at page 15, just, just have a look. They give you themes in your text. Uh, that you, this is, that'll be enough, I'm sure, that'll help you. Right, then Kitty. Kitty, you asked about how to write a Hamlet essay. Now, it says for that statement, and I got in Bali to go back and check, and she promises me she's checked. There is no statement. So, Kitty, I'm not quite sure what statement. So, you were asking about a Hamlet literary essay. So, Kitty, let me just do something kind of in general. Um, they give you a statement. So, let us say something like um, the play Hamlet. So I'm going to underline Hamlet. That's the play, not the character. That the play Hamlet explores, let's say, exactly what we were talking about, the treachery of appearances. Let's combine those two questions. Now, what you need to do with the longer literary essay, this is the 25 mark essay. Do not take the topic and make it the thesis statement. You are not expected simply to provide evidence of treachery in the play and appearances that can't be trusted in the play. That isn't what this essay is about. That's your mini poetry essay. You take the topic, you've studied your poems, you look at the topic, you think of an answer, 10 minutes later, whoosh, there it is. This is asking you, hang on, you need to think about it. So, you need to spend time, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, how long are you prepared to spend on the planning? The longer you plan, the better, in that you will present a better argument. So, if we say that Hamlet explores treachery and appearances, one of the things that you could think about is what kind of treachery. The treachery where somebody trusts somebody because the character is a family member or a friend. So, who am I thinking of? Claudius murders old Hamlet, that Claudius tries to kill Hamlet, that Rosencrantz and Guildenstern betray Hamlet, but immediately at the back of your mind, you're saying, well, hang on a second, but there is a good friend in this play, that is Horatio. 
So what you might like to do is write down bits of the story around treachery and then work out an argument that the play explores the shock and horror and disbelief of characters when they are betrayed by those they trust fully. Do you see if this is one paragraph, how you can do the ghost, horrible, most horrible, thus was I by a brother's hand at once of life dispatch, etc. You can do all of that. You can do Hamlet saying, he is trying, you know, he was trying to murder me. You can do Hamlet with his anger against Rosencrantz and Guildenstern because these are people they trust. Then who else would come into this? Ophelia. Because Hamlet's fury, his rage against, get thee to a nunnery, go! Because of his sense of betrayal. Gertrude. So you can do all of this, your, your, problem now is, whoa, how do I do all of this in a 100-word paragraph? Because that's really how long a paragraph should be. Right, what else does the play then say about appearances? That appearances can deceive. So which appearances? So maybe Gertrude, why she would hang on him as if increase of appetite had grown by what it fed on. He, Hamlet, believed that his mother loved his father, the sense that she remarries, and she remarries so quickly, and it's incense, incest. So that sense that appearances deceive, that a character can believe in another character, and do you see the link with our first paragraph, that the disbelief and the horror is because the person has been so deceived by appearances. So the link is, why is the character responding with this disbelief and horror? Because the person was deceived by those appearances. And again, you could talk about Claudius's appearance, Gertrude's appearance, Rosencrantz and Guildenstone looking as if they are friends, Ophelia, now she's a problem. Because she appears to betray Hamlet. Are you going to argue that she does because she connives with her father's plan to spy on Hamlet? So we seem to be moving into a third paragraph. Why do some of the characters put up a deliberately false appearance? So if we're going to deal with Ophelia, we're going to deal with the pressure that is brought to bear by her father. But if we're looking at Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, are we going to argue that this is greed? Are we going to argue that it is the pressure of the king trying to please the king and queen? But there's the constant promise of reward. So how are we going to deal with this? So do you see... I'm now, I've got at least three paragraphs, but I'm working towards an answer. And always think about your counter argument that the appearance, for example, of Horatio is an honest and decent friend. Look at Hamlet. Hamlet starts by taking pride in the fact that he does not have a false appearance. Seems, madam. Nay, it is. I know not seems. So he says, what you see is the truth. And by the end of Act 1, he's planning to put on an antic disposition. So do you see it's going to take me time? I need half an hour to plan this. But what am I looking for? I'm looking for an argument. So one part of the argument will be around how characters respond. The next part of the argument is why they respond like that. Another part of the argument is why do they put up a false appearance? Is it self-seeking? Is it self-serving in Claudius, in 
Polonius in Laertes is it self-serving. What do we then do with poor Ophelia, who's kind of under pressure from her father? Then where are we going to put in Hamlet? Because we're going to have to deal with Hamlet. What about dealing with Horatio? Where there is, where's Horatio? I, got, I lost him. Is that p paragraph five? Uh, getting a bit long, so I might have to shorten. You need to plan the number of words. Okay, I hope that helps, Kitty, that that gives you some idea.